Strategy Part 1 Practical Steps Now to Improve Disabled People's Everyday Lives Rights and Perceptions Removing Barriers to Participating Fully in Public and Civic Life and Wider Society Disabled people have told us that the negative attitudes of others has a significant impact across all areas of their everyday lives. A Wales Roundtable participant said, Very often second class, you're not seen as equal. And we have every right. We still only have one go at life like everyone else. And just because we can't walk as well, see as well, hear as well, whatever, that doesn't make us any less of a person. Just 8% of disabled people, 8% of carers and 12% of the general public agree or strongly agree that the views held by members of the public about disability are generally helpful for disabled people. Awkwardness, misguided empathy, uncertainty about language and prejudice are daily occurrences for many disabled people and their families and friends. Catherine said, one of the worst things is people being patronising. The impacts of negative perceptions on disabled people are wide-ranging. They include loneliness, barriers to employment and disability hate crime. Over half, 54% of disabled people, worry about being insulted or harassed in the street, and 45% worry about being physically attacked by strangers. Attitudes are changing but have further to go. Data from the British Social Attitudes Survey in 2017 found that 83% of respondents thought of disabled people as the same as everyone else, compared with 77% in 2005. Societal change takes time, but there is much more that the government can and should do to change negative perceptions of disabled people and inspire wider change in society. To help ensure disabled people can play a full role in society, we're bringing forward legislation to remove historic barriers to participation in public life, using the honour system to better recognise the exceptional contribution of disabled people to the UK, exploring how best to support disabled candidates standing for election, inspiring social change across the UK through new public awareness-raising campaigns, Approving access to justice. Publishing a new cross-government strategy to tackle the crime and disorder that undermines the quality of life for everyone, including disability hate crime. We're ambitious to do more to tackle crime against disabled people. The Disability Unit will prioritise further cross-government action in this area in 2021 and 22. Removing Historic Barriers to Participation in Public Life We will remove these barriers and ensure disabled people can play a full role in public life. Common law currently prohibits anyone from being present in the jury room who is not one of the 12 members of the jury. While most disabled people can serve as jurors, deaf people who need a British Sign Language interpreter cannot. Ministry of Justice will bring forward legislation in 2021 as part of the Police, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Bill to amend common law so that deaf people who need a BSL interpreter can do jury service. We will also make it easier for disabled people to cast their vote. Under current rules, disabled people can only get help at polling stations from another eligible voter or a close family member. To improve the voting experience for disabled people, the Cabinet Office has introduced the Elections Bill to require returning officers to consider the needs of people with a wide range of disabilities. The legislation will also enable disabled people to receive help casting their vote from any companion who is over the age of 18 in UK parliamentary elections. The Cabinet Office will work with the Electoral Commission to provide guidance to help returning officers meet the new requirement, including on assistive technologies that can be provided in polling stations. We will remove barriers disabled people experience in taking up leadership roles in public life. This includes magistrates, MPs and public appointees. Ministry of Justice is investing £1 million by spring 2022 to recruit more disabled magistrates in England and Wales as part of a wider effort to improve diversity alongside other underrepresented groups. 
Ministry of Justice will use disabled people's feedback on the experience of applying to be a magistrate and improve recruitment data to assess whether any additional action is needed to support and encourage disabled candidates to apply successfully to the magistracy by spring 2023. We are also committed to seeing more disabled people becoming elected representatives. Building on the experience of the Access to Elected Office Fund and the Enable Fund, MHCLG will support a new scheme from April 2022 to support those seeking to become candidates and, as importantly, once they've been elected to public office. Political parties too need to play their role in helping those with disabilities achieve and succeed in public office. We will continue to engage constructively with political parties, disability charities and electoral administrators about progress in this area. The Cabinet Office will consider how we can best support those standing for public office and those who hold public office. Deborah told us, as someone who is passionate about advancing the disability agenda, sometimes you're asked about disability and it's like you're expected to say you're a superhuman who has raised £10 million and climbed three mountains. I'm a normal everyday person, a boring 39-year-old woman working as a tax director. It's difficult for me to accept that there may be some things I can't do. I don't see disability defining me, but I'm probably a better person for it. I'm much more resilient. I have even more determination. I can be more flexible, compassionate towards people. I don't want people to think they're not good enough or can't achieve things because they have this label. We are committed to ensuring fairness and inclusivity in public appointments. Typically, these will be ministerial appointments to a public body or advisory committee. We've made good progress in increasing the number of disabled people in public leadership roles. In 2019, 11% of public appointees reported that they had a disability, up from just 5% in 2018. We will encourage talented disabled people to apply for public appointments and support them through the application process. The Cabinet Office will launch a new website and application system by March 2022 to improve how talented candidates, including disabled people, can access public appointments. This will be coupled with increased outreach, including with disability networks. We will also make changes to the honour system to better recognise the achievements of disabled people in all walks of life. This includes introducing a new Easy Read nomination form and leaflet to improve the accessibility of the nominations process to people with learning difficulties. Launching a new dedicated and accessible honours website to promote the inclusivity of the honours system, offering information about the honours system in accessible formats, working with disabled people's organisations to promote the honours system. New campaigns to inspire social change across the UK. Public awareness campaigns have a major role to play in driving social change. We know that campaigns to tackle the stigma associated with loneliness and mental health conditions have successfully raised awareness of these issues and inspired thousands of people to take action. We will take action to change perceptions of disabled people and to inspire wider social change. The Disability Unit will develop a UK-wide campaign to increase public awareness and understanding of disability dispel ingrained and unhelpful stereotypes and promote the diverse contributions that disabled people have made and continue to make to public life. One in four disabled people say negative attitudes from other passengers stop them using public transport. We will continue to address negative public attitudes to disabled people on public transport through DFT's £1 million It's Everyone's Journey campaign. The campaign benefits everyone who uses public transport, highlighting that we can all play a part in making transport more inclusive. These broader campaigns will be complemented by the first ever national initiative to raise understanding of autism, led by DHSC. 
A survey by the National Autistic Society in 2015 showed that 99.5% of people had heard of autism. But only 16% of autistic people and their families thought the public understood autism. DHSC will develop an Autism Public Understanding Initiative by autumn 2021, working with autistic people and their families and the voluntary sector. DHSC will trial and evaluate the impact of the initiative by May 2022. This initiative will help the public to understand the strengths and positives of being autistic, as well as the challenges autistic people might face in their daily lives. It will also emphasise the diversity of the autistic community, including the presentation of autism in women and girls, the LGBT community, and autistic people from ethnic minority backgrounds. Improving access to justice Access to justice is important for disabled people and non-disabled people alike. Disabled people can face particular challenges in both the civil and criminal justice systems, whether as victims, witnesses, defendants or offenders. Ministry of Justice reported in 2018 that most legal aid clients identified as disabled, 58%. To improve disabled people's experience of the justice system, we will improve access to courts and legal support. Support disabled victims and witnesses. Improve frontline staff's understanding of neurodiversity. Improving access to courts and legal support. HMCTS reform. The HM Courts and Tribunal Service, HMCTS, reform programme will change how people access the courts. There will be more online provision, including remote hearings and investment in buildings to make them more accessible. New online HMCTS services are designed and tested with disabled people. This helps to design accessible services so that those with assistive technology can self-serve and simplify language to reduce the cognitive load for users. This year, 2021, HMCTS will launch a new national support service for users in England and Wales who need help to access online services. This means that support will be provided in person and remotely via phone and other technology. Intermediaries Intermediaries are impartial communication specialists responsible for enabling communication with disabled people, among others, in the justice system. They support disabled people, if their ability to communicate is impaired due to age or incapacity, in order to improve the quality of evidence and to make sure disabled people can understand and participate in the proceedings. Ministry of Justice is reviewing intermediary provision across the justice system and will share recommendations regarding the future of intermediary provision by spring 2022. Supporting disabled victims and witnesses. Ministry of Justice is working to remove the barriers for those with protected characteristics to access support, including disabled people who are victims or witnesses. Ministry of Justice brought a new revised Victims Code into force in England and Wales on the 1st of April 2021, which sets out enhanced rights for disabled people as well as other victims. The Code brings together 12 overarching rights that are straightforward, concise and easy to understand, outlining the minimum level of information and service victims can expect at every stage of the justice process. These include, for the first time, eligible victims will be automatically referred to the Victim Contact Scheme, VCS, and offered a Victim Liaison Officer, VLO, who provides vital updates on offenders as they serve their sentence, including their potential release from prison. The ability for vulnerable victims to have their cross-examination pre-recorded away from the courtroom reducing the stress of giving evidence in court, which many find intimidating. The right to be informed of the reasons why a suspect will not be prosecuted. If unhappy, victims will also be able to ask the police or Crown Prosecution Service to review this decision. Improving frontline staff's understanding of neurodiversity. 
Staff awareness and understanding is a key enabler of better outcomes for neurodivergent offenders. Neurodivergent people, such as autistic people, dyslexics and people with learning disabilities, are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. For example, around 28% of offenders are assessed to have a learning difficulty or challenge. And we know that the experience of courts, prisons and probation can represent particular challenges for neurodivergent individuals. Ministry of Justice is helping create cultural change in how the criminal justice system responds to neurodivergent conditions through a nationwide, evidence-based approach to neurodiversity, with a key focus on staff awareness. Ministry of Justice has, therefore, asked HM Inspectorate of Prisons and HM Inspectorate of Probation, with support from HM Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services, to carry out an independent review of neurodiversity in the criminal justice system. Ministry of Justice will work with disability organisations to develop a national neurodiversity training toolkit for staff, which will be rolled out in 2022. Tackling Crime Against Disabled People Disabled people are disproportionately affected by crime. Disabled adults are more likely to be victims of crime, 20.8%, than other adults, 19%, and disabled children aged 10 to 15, 12%, are almost twice as likely to be victims of crime than other children, 6.3%. Disabled women are more likely to experience domestic abuse and sexual assault than non-disabled women. Those with mental health conditions, learning difficulties and social and behavioural impairments are most frequently victimised. About half of disabled people report feeling unsafe in their neighbourhood, 45%, worrying about being insulted or harassed in the street or any other public place, 54%, or worrying about being physically attacked by strangers, 45%, at least some of the time. At the most extreme, negative attitudes to disabled people can manifest in disability hate crime. The number of disability hate crimes recorded by the police in England and Wales have increased from 1,676 in 2011 to 12 to 8,469 in 2019 to 20. While this rise is in part due to the increased willingness of some victims to come forward and improve police recording practices, it is likely that many disability hate crimes go unreported. We are committed to tackling disability hate crime. In 2021, the Home Office will publish a new cross-government strategy to tackle the crime and disorder that undermines the quality of life for everyone. This will include tackling hate crime, of which tackling disability hate crime will be an integral part. The Home Office commits to work with disabled people and other disability stakeholders to develop the new strategy for publication in the autumn. The Government will also carefully consider the Law Commission's recommendations from its comprehensive review of hate crime laws, due to report in late 2021. To support this, the Crown Prosecution Service will bring together a panel consisting of disabled people's organisations, academics, partner agencies from government and the police to advise on further improvements covering support to prosecutors and the policy statement on disability hate crime and other crimes against disabled people. Justice is devolved in Northern Ireland. The Northern Ireland Executive recognises the importance of improving disabled people's experiences of reporting hate crimes. The Northern Ireland Executive, together with the Police Service of Northern Ireland, PSNI, fund the Hate Crime Advocacy Service. This offers victims of disability hate crime access to a disability advocate, who provides support through the investigation process, ensuring access to justice and safety in their own community. The Scottish Government engaged closely with DPOs, Police Scotland and other justice partners to develop the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill, which received royal assent in April 2021. DPOs were also engaged in the development of hate crime awareness raising campaigns and on work to improve data and evidence and on third-party reporting. 
In 2020, the Welsh Government funded All Wales People First to lead a hate crime consultation with its network of adults with learning disabilities across all local authorities in Wales. This helped build a picture of their experiences and understanding of hate crime. Findings will help inform future policy. The Welsh Government consulted with disabled people via focus groups when developing the communication campaign Hate Hurts Wales, which aimed to raise awareness and reporting of hate crime, including disability hate crime. We are committed to doing more to tackle crime against disabled people. The Disability Unit will identify areas where the government can go further in tackling this issue in 2021-22. Ensuring protection at home Millions of disabled people receive excellent support in their own homes from paid, unpaid and voluntary carers. We know this is greatly valued, helping disabled people with a multitude of day-to-day -day tasks and to live more independent and fulfilling lives. However, we are concerned that disabled people have told us that existing measures to protect victims of abuse by people providing care are not working well. We are committed to addressing any instances of abuse or exploitation. The Home Office and DHSC will jointly lead a review into the protections and support available to adults abused in their own homes by people providing their care, coordinating inputs from wider government, disabled people, carers' organisations and other interested parties. We expect the review to complete by the end of 2022. Housing. Creating more accessible, adapted and safer homes. Many disabled people wake up every morning in a home that is not adapted to their needs. Nearly half, 47% of disabled respondents to the UK Disability Survey reported having at least some difficulty getting in and out of where they live. There have been many improvements in accessibility for disabled people in recent decades, aided by tightened regulations and increased awareness of inclusive design. The proportion of homes in England with key accessible features nearly doubled between 2009 and 2018 from 5% to 9%. Disabled people tell us that there is much further still to go. The evidence tells a similar story. Less than half of the local plans in England for new homes include requirements for a proportion of new homes to meet higher accessibility standards. A decent home is the foundation for an independent life. A quarter of people receiving equipment or minor adaptations to their home needed less help than previously. 95% said their quality of life was better after receiving equipment or a minor adaptation. Sue told us, My son left college at 22 and we worked with Sheffield Council concerning his independence and supported living. A transition social worker supported him to find suitable accommodation, along with My Safe Home, and he purchased a home with DWP support. It is the best thing we have ever done for my son. He loves his home and has developed independent skills way above our expectations. He has support 24 hours a day, and this whole success has given us peace of mind for his future. We will take immediate steps to boost the supply of housing for disabled people by raising accessibility standards for new homes, increasing the supply of affordable homes, including supported housing, and accelerating the adaptation of existing homes by improving the efficiency of local authority delivery of the Disabled Facilities Grant, worth £573 million in 2021 to 2022. Extend disabled tenants' rights on accessibility and ensure the safety of disabled people in buildings for when there are emergencies. Boosting the accessibility and supply of housing for disabled people. A decent home will mean different things to different people. A home with good public transport, close to family and friends, can be as important as a home with the right adaptations. Driving choice is key. Tony said, It's so important to see things and still be part of the world.
The Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, MHCLG, completed a consultation on raising accessibility standards for new homes in England in December 2020 and has been considering the responses and next steps. MHCLG will confirm plans to improve the framework to deliver accessible new homes by December 2021. These reforms must be informed by robust data and evidence of disabled people's experiences. MHCLG is commissioning new research to develop the statutory guidance on meeting building regulations covering access to and use of buildings, approved document M. The research will help us to improve guidance and inform future policy. It will consider modern building design approaches, technology and building use and operation. Northern Ireland is taking a different approach to increase choice for disabled people in both social and private housing. The Northern Ireland Housing Executive, NIHE, is developing an accessible housing register for social housing. It is also exploring a possible private sector interface, allowing accessible private sector properties for rent or sale to be advertised on the NIHE website. The Scottish Government's Housing to 2040 route map, published 2021, will introduce a new accessible home standard to ensure accessibility and adaptability for all new and existing homes. The new standard is intended to deliver a step change in the availability and adaptability of housing for disabled people. We will take steps to increase the supply of affordable and supported housing. Purpose-built supported housing with integrated care services can help disabled people live independently. There is increasing demand for supported housing and we are committed to boosting supply through the Affordable Homes Programme. MHCLG has committed that 10% of the 180,000 homes built through the £11.5 billion Affordable Homes Programme 2021-26 will be for supported housing. DHSC also provides funding to build specialised housing through the Care and Support Specialised Housing Fund. This is designed to help adults with a learning or physical disability, those with mental health conditions and older people. DHSC, working with MHCLG, will invest £71 million in the Care and Support Specialised Housing Fund in the financial year 2021-22. These schemes will help to meet the growing demand for supported housing. We will continue to work with the supported housing sector to ensure that disabled and older people with support and care needs have the right housing options. We recognise the autonomy that home ownership can provide and want to ensure that disabled people too have the opportunity to own their own home. About half of the homes delivered under the £11.5 billion Affordable Homes Programme will be open to a new shared ownership scheme. The programme will also unlock a further £38 billion in public and private investment in affordable housing. This will help aspiring homeowners to take their first step onto the housing ladder. We have reduced the initial stake from 25% to 10% and introduce support for shared owners with the cost of repairs and maintenance for the first 10 years on new build homes. For people unable to access the new standard shared ownership model on new build homes, there is HOLD, the Home Ownership for People with Long-Term Disability Scheme. This allows people to buy a suitable home on the open market on shared ownership terms. MHCLG will make the new shared ownership model, including the reduced 10% minimum initial stake, available to disabled people buying a home under the hold scheme. Residents living in the new rented homes funded by the Affordable Homes Programme 2021-26 will also have the right to shared ownership. Disabled facilities grants available via local councils in England and Wales can help disabled people meet the cost of adaptations needed to make their homes more accessible. Joyce told us to actually go out of the door without anyone helping me was incredible. We will accelerate the delivery of home adaptations in England and Wales by improving local delivery of the disabled facilities grant. 
Following an independent review of the Disabled Facilities Grant, published in December 2018, MHCLG and DHSC will jointly publish new government guidance for local authorities in England on the effective delivery of the £573 million Disabled Facilities Grant during 2021. This investment supports our commitment to help older and disabled people to live safely and independently in their own homes. By the end of the 2021-22 financial year, we will have invested over £4 billion in the grant since 2010. Extending tenants' rights on accessibility. Disabled people are more likely to rent rather than own their own homes. The Equality Act 2010 included provisions to give tenants the right to required landlords to make reasonable adjustments to the common parts of residential buildings, including hallways, entrances and stairs. This provision will now be brought into force in England and Wales. The Cabinet Office will progress work to require landlords to make reasonable adjustments to the common parts of leasehold and commonhold homes. A consultation is planned for 2021. This will make it easier for disabled people to enter and leave their homes. Landlords will be allowed to get tenants to pay for the work in line with the Equality Act existing legislation. Tenants and residents, including those on low incomes or with disabled children, will be able to apply for a Disabled Facilities Grant. Ensuring the safety of disabled people Building Regulations Guidance, Approved Document B, includes provisions for assisted escape for disabled people. While MHCLG concluded in 2015 that the provisions in these regulations met minimum requirements, there are nonetheless opportunities to go further. MHCLG is now reviewing the evidence around means of escape for disabled people, the effectiveness of Approved Document B and possible alternative approaches. MHCLG has commissioned new research to develop robust evidence to inform policy in England on the means of escape from buildings, care homes and specialised housing for disabled people. This will conclude by autumn 2021. Transport – Improving the Accessibility and Experience of Everyday Journeys Everyday journeys to work, school, to see family and friends, to access essential services like health and care, are fraught with uncertainty for many disabled people. Jessica told us, The world is different. You have to book if you want to use a bus. You have to book if you want to get a train. Spontaneity is a luxury. The Department for Transport, DFT's Inclusive Transport Strategy, first published in 2018, has helped accelerate progress. However, the challenges are often significant and we acknowledge there is a lot still to do. 99% of buses now meet minimum accessibility standards, but the proportion of wheelchair accessible vehicles is just 58% in taxi fleets and 2% for private hire vehicles. Disappointingly, these figures have been falling since 2014. Disabled people are frequent users of public transport, as well as taxis and private hire vehicles. Transport infrastructure, access to toilets, passenger information and signage is as important as access to transport vehicles. On the roads, disabled people say that streetscapes can present problems, including curb issues, street furniture and pop-up infrastructure. Our determination to deliver a transport system which is accessible for all remains unchanged. We know from our own lived experience research that reliable transport can be transformational in supporting an independent life. Carl told us, Throughout my early childhood, I was really clumsy and lacked coordination. Eventually, at the age of 10, I was diagnosed as having Becker muscular dystrophy. The condition was stable for a while, but at 16 my mobility started to worsen. I started college but was dependent on my parents as I was unable to access public transport. Then I was made aware of the Mobility Allowance, the predecessor of DLA and PIP, which I applied for and successfully obtained. The opportunities it opened up for me were truly life-changing. 
It enabled me to access a vehicle by motability and gave me independence for the first time in my life. We will take further steps to tackle persistent accessibility issues across the transport network, including rail, buses, taxis and roads, and to enable disabled people to travel with confidence by addressing staff training, information and the attitudes and behaviours of others. Transforming the accessibility of the railway station network. The Access for All programme was launched in 2006 to address the issues faced by disabled passengers when using railway stations in England, Scotland and Wales. It has so far provided accessible, step-free routes at over 200 stations, alongside smaller scale improvements at more than 1,500 stations. As a result, over three quarters of rail journeys are now through step-free stations, compared with only half in 2005. We published the William Shapps Plan for Rail in May 2021, which commits to the establishment of a new rail body, Great British Railways. The white paper contains a suite of accessibility reforms, including a statutory duty on Great British Railways to improve accessibility and the development and implementation of a new national accessibility strategy for the railways. This strategy will provide the first, joined-up, system-wide approach to accessibility, including getting to, from and around stations and on and off trains. But still, only around one-fifth of our 2,500 stations have step-free access to and between all platforms, Unlike railway vehicles, which must be legally accessible by 2020, there is no legally binding end date for making stations accessible. DFT will conduct a network-wide accessibility audit of station facilities at all 2,565 mainline railway stations in Great Britain to inform future investment decisions. Transport is a partially devolved issue allowing Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to benefit from UK-wide infrastructure investment, while also responding to local needs. Transport for Wales is delivering a £700 million metro transformation project on Core Valley Lines, jointly funded by the Welsh Government, the UK Government, Cardiff City Region and the European Union, this will provide step-free access to Welsh stations within scope, and step-free boarding and disembarking on new rolling stock trains. This is only part of the work underway to improve rail station accessibility. DFT will consult on an update to the Design Standards for Accessible Stations this year, 2021. People with sight issues have told us how valuable tactile paving is on station platforms. It can help to avert tragedies. However, many stations still do not have this. We are committed to addressing this. DFT will work with Network Rail to develop proposals for the accelerated upgrade of rail station platforms with tactile paving, improving disabled people's experience of travelling by train. A UK disability survey respondent wrote, Public transport is a major issue for disabled people. There are countless barriers to accessing trains, tubes, taxis, buses, etc. Manual boarding ramps aren't good enough. That's not genuine independence, especially when staff can treat you like a nuisance when you want to turn up and go. We have a right to spontaneous travel too. The majority of train and tube stations aren't even accessible. That needs to change. Disabled passengers have told us that there are three things needed for their rail journeys to go well. Information to make informed decisions, a quality of experience and control over their journey. DFT will bring forward plans to improve disabled people's experience of travelling by train. DFT will work closely with rail companies to further develop the Passenger Assist Programme for Disabled Passengers – to increase people's confidence to travel. This will include introducing a passenger assist app this year, 2021. Some disabled passengers describe their experiences of travelling by train as anxiety-inducing. Other than the emergency contact equipment fitted in or near to the wheelchair spaces, 
the only means of alerting staff if they need assistance is to physically find the guard or train manager or to contact the operator through social media. This can lead disabled passengers to worry that they will not be able to ask for or get help when they need it. It can undermine the confidence of disabled people to travel independently at all. DFT has invited innovative project ideas to improve communication for disabled passengers and others with reduced mobility on rail services across Great Britain. This will enable people to contact train crew members directly from any seat on the train. Contracts will be awarded by July 2021. The difficulty in contacting staff for assistance is a recognised issue for disabled people across the UK. Similar work to address this is also taking place in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. In April 2021, ScotRail's Passenger Assist Service reduced its assistance booking notice period to one hour, and the introduction of a BSL app has significantly improved frontline staff communication with BSL users. A hate crime charter developed in 2021 with DPOs encourages transport providers, the public and other services to adopt a zero-tolerance approach to hate crime on public transport and report crimes. Improving the accessibility of buses, bus stations and bus stops. We want disabled people to be able to complete bus journeys independently and with confidence. Audible and visible next stop announcements can make it easier for everyone to use buses. As announced in Bus Back Better, the National Bus Strategy for England, subject to final analysis, DFT will introduce regulations by summer 2022 to require bus companies to provide audible and visual announcements on board their services in Great Britain. In the meantime, we encourage bus operators to provide accessible information on board their services when introducing new or upgraded vehicles. DFT has already committed £2 million to help the smallest bus companies to provide audible and visible information on services. DFT will invest a further £1.5 million during 2021. This funding will be available to bus operators across Great Britain. Under the Public Service Vehicles Accessibility Regulations 2000, buses and coaches designed to carry over 22 passengers and which are used on local and scheduled services in the UK must incorporate at least one wheelchair space, a lift or ramp, priority seating and colour contrasting handholds and step edges. The needs and expectations of disabled people are likely to have changed in the last 20 years. DFT will review the Public Service Vehicle Accessibility Regulations 2000, starting with research in 2022. The department will also commission research into the design of bus stations and bus stops in England by April 2022. We are committed to supporting inclusive bus and coach services which enable all passengers, disabled and non-disabled alike, to travel with confidence. Tackling shortages in community transport drivers Community transport services are essential for many people's independence, yet we know that some organisations struggle to recruit drivers qualified to drive their vehicles. DFT will work with the Community Transport Association and with other stakeholders to understand this issue better and to support the sector to continue its vital work. Improving the accessibility of taxis and private hire vehicles. Current protection for disabled people using taxis and private hire vehicles, PHVs, is patchy. Except where drivers have a medical exemption, it is an offence to refuse a wheelchair user access to a designated wheelchair accessible vehicle. It is similarly an offence to refuse an assistance dog owner access to any vehicle. But other disabled people do not share the same protections. Disabled people continue to report being discriminated against by taxi and PHV drivers or not given necessary assistance. 
DFT will take forward legislation during the current parliament to strengthen the law on the carriage of disabled people in taxis and PHVs across Great Britain. This will ensure protection from overcharging and the provision of appropriate assistance regardless of the service they choose to use. We also recognise how important it is that local authorities, taxi and PHV drivers understand the needs and expectations of disabled customers and how to support them appropriately. DFT will continue to encourage local authorities to require drivers to complete disability awareness training. DFT will, as soon as legislative time allows, mandate the completion of disability awareness training through new national minimum standards for taxi and PHV licensing. In the meantime, the department will consult during 2021 on updated guidance for licensing authorities, including strengthening recommendations on supporting an inclusive service. Making lifeline ports more accessible for disabled passengers. Disabled residents on the Isle of Wight and the Isles of Scilly rely on ferry services to connect with the UK mainland for work, leisure and access to essential services such as healthcare. DFT will provide up to £1 million to improve the accessibility of lifeline sea ports on the Isle of Wight and the Isles of Scilly for disabled people with ports invited to apply for funding for improvements in the financial year 2021-22. Creating accessibility standards for electric vehicle charging points. There is almost no accessibility regulation covering electric vehicle EV charging points. We have an opportunity to build in accessibility to an emerging service. DFT recently consulted on improving the consumer experience at public charge points. This includes improving the accessibility for all users to understand the challenges facing EV drivers. DFT will work with consumer groups and charge point operators to set clear accessibility standards for charging infrastructure in 2021 to 2022. Improving the Blue Badge Scheme The Blue Badge Scheme supports the mobility of over 2 million people in the UK, helping them to park closer to the goods and services they need to use. In 2019, in the biggest change to the scheme in over 40 years, we extended eligibility in England to people with non-visible disabilities. We have reviewed how those changes have worked and found that while many people are benefiting from badges for the first time, aspects of the scheme could be improved. DFT is improving the online application process and will continue to work with Blue Badge users and local authorities that administer the scheme in England to ensure that it works in the best possible way for all users. Tackling pavement parking Pavement parking can cause real problems for pedestrians, especially for people with sight or mobility impairments. Tackling pavement parking would help free pavements for vulnerable pedestrians to make journeys safely and more easily. It would reduce the occasions when pedestrians are forced into the road to navigate around vehicles. It would also reduce pavement damage that can pose a trip hazard. Scotland has passed legislation to control pavement parking and Wales has announced plans for new regulations. DFT has consulted on options to help local authorities address the problem more effectively and will announce next steps later this year, 2021. Jobs, making the world of work more inclusive and accessible. The working week is a distant reality for too many disabled people. Les told us, I've never had trouble going to interviews, dealing with them, carrying them out. The biggest problem comes after the interview, because employers will make any sort of excuse not to take the leap of faith. They don't want to take the risk on you. Work is not an option for all disabled people, but many disabled people who can and want to work find themselves excluded from the workplace. 56% of disabled people who are not employed, who responded to the UK Disability Survey, agree, or strongly agree, that they would like more support in finding a job. 
There are 7 million working-age people with a disability or long-term health condition in the UK, but only a little over half are in work. Legislation reform has driven progress. The Disability Discrimination Act, introduced in 1995, and its successor, the Equality Act 2010, made disabled people's rights clearer. It is against the law for employers to discriminate against a person because of a disability. An employer must also make reasonable adjustments to the way employment is structured. In 2017, we set a goal to see 1 million more disabled people in work by 2027. In the three years since, the number of disabled people in work has grown by 800,000. We remain committed to achieving the challenging goal of 1 million more disabled people in work. And, once we have, we will work with disabled people and their representatives to think about how we can build on this success. The disability employment gap has narrowed significantly in recent years, from 33.8 percentage points in 2014 to 28.6 percentage points in 2021. Despite this progress, too many disabled people still find themselves excluded from the job market leaving them feeling that their talents and qualifications are being wasted. Less than half, 48% of the employed disabled people who responded to the UK Disability Survey agree or strongly agree that their employer is flexible and makes sufficient reasonable adjustments for disabled people. Only a quarter, 24%, agree or strongly agree that their promotion opportunities are the same as their colleagues. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy has also had an impact on disabled people's work. Disabled people are one of the groups more likely to have experienced a reduction in earnings through redundancy, a reduction in hours, or being furloughed. We know that good work supports good health and independence. Claire told us, As a deaf professional, work has enabled me to achieve my aspirations – and to feel that I am making worthwhile contributions to society. I face many challenges, obstacles, and the highs and lows of working across such demanding employment. For me, having access to work has been invaluable. This enables me to employ a pool of preferred British Sign Language interpreters. We work together as professionals to ensure high standards, quality, and consistency across my two roles. If it wasn't for them, I think this would have had a huge detrimental impact on my life. My circumstances would be very different in the way I'm living today. We are ambitious to go further. We will set out proposals to improve support for disabled people to start or stay in work. Create an access to work adjustments passport to support disabled people with their transition into employment, including disabled students leaving education. Encourage employers to recruit, retain and progress their disabled employees and to create inclusive workplaces by reviewing Disability Confident, promoting the voluntary reporting framework and consulting on taking this further and disseminating best practices to employers. We will scale up supported employment services, strengthen rights in the workplace, encouraging flexible working and introducing carers' leave and improving access to advice on employment rights for disabled people and employers. We will explore with disabled people what extra help would be most useful for those wishing to start a business, champion opportunities for disabled people in the civil service, and ensure the support to thrive at work. Create more opportunities for disabled people to serve in the armed forces and the agencies. More support for disabled people to start and stay in work. We want to do more to support disabled people and people with health conditions to start and stay in work. To be truly effective, a range of support is required. This includes earlier back-to-work support and help staying in work where possible, ensuring that our job centres are engaging, welcoming an expert and personalising support to recognise that one size does not fit all. To reduce the chance of people being out of work in the long term, DWP will explore offering earlier and more intensive back-to-work support in job centres for people before their Work Capacity Assessment, WCA. 
This support will go beyond the existing health and work conversation, which people take part in before their WCA takes place. Where people have recently fallen out of work because of a health condition or disability, job centres could do more to help people to consider appropriate alternative employment opportunities and raise awareness of in-work support. This could involve more support from a person's work coach, more often and earlier in the claim. DWP is looking at a range of options, from continuing to make job centres more welcoming to asking what more can be done to encourage voluntary take-up of employment support. DWP is introducing a new approach to conditionality for disabled people and people with health conditions, aiming to enable an honest and open conversation between a person and their work coach about what they can do. The aim is to build commitment to move towards work and into work where possible. Work coaches start by applying no mandatory requirements, but agree with the person the voluntary steps the person will take. These could include, for example, developing a CV or looking for suitable jobs online. Using their discretion, work coaches apply mandatory requirements only if they are needed. Because health and employment are related, DWP wants to do more to join up employment support with health services. DWP is continuing to build on current evidence-based programmes that provide specialised support to disabled people and people with health conditions. For people with complex barriers who need more intensive, personalised support, DWP introduced the Intensive Personalised Employment Support, IPS, programme in 2019 in England and Wales. From August 2021, to meet an anticipated rise in need for support as a result of COVID-19, DWP will increase places on IPES by 25%. This will help ensure that more disabled people and people with health conditions will be able to rapidly access appropriate tailored support. Transforming Access to Work Access to work provides support for disabled people at work that is not covered by employers' responsibility to make reasonable adjustments. This could include special equipment, support worker services or help getting to and from work. DWP is committed to transforming access to work. DWP is working to make access to work a digital service, fit for the 21st century, which is innovative, visible and accessible. DWP will radically improve employers and disabled people's experience of using the service, including improving the payment process for employers and streamlining the user journey. The department has already introduced the following improvements to the service. 24-7 online access to work application to enable disabled people and employers to choose a time that is convenient for them to make their application. A digital renewal process with a text or email reminder service to ensure continuity of support. A fully digital communication support interview customer journey process. Updated access to work staff guidance, ensuring stakeholder feedback is incorporated and that social model language is used throughout the guidance. We recognise we must go further. DWP is working with disabled people, disabled people's organisations and charities via the Access to Work stakeholder forums to develop an Access to Work Adjustments Passport, which will be piloted during 2021. The Access to Work Adjustment Passport will provide disabled people with greater flexibility and smooth transitions between job roles, It will provide an indicative overview for employers of the possible support available from access to work, which will help build employer understanding of disability and adjustments. It will transform the access to work customer journey by reducing the need for repeated assessments where the individual's needs remain the same, enable a seamless transition and set the expectation with employers that tailored specialist aids and appliances will follow the passport holder when they change jobs. To test the passport, DWP is carrying out a series of pilots with young people who are transitioning from education to work or from work back to education, for example in order to retrain or upskill, with veterans leaving the armed forces, and with freelancers and contractors moving between job roles. 
We will build on the lessons learned from the pilots to inform future development. We will make available a passport for all disabled students, including those receiving Disabled Students Allowance, DCA, when they leave university. This will provide disabled young people with the confidence and certainty they need as they enter the world of work. DWP is committed to improving awareness of access to work. The department has delivered a paid communication campaign to do this and to widen the reach to increase take-up of grants. DWP has begun a renewed effort to ensure disabled people are aware of the benefits of access to work. DWP will review the effectiveness of the campaign to ensure activities that have achieved the greatest reach are taken forward in future campaigns. The passport will help to deliver our ambition to actively raise awareness of access to work in schools and universities to enable young disabled people to make informed career choices and achieve their aspirations. DWP is committed to improving the offer for disabled people. It has actively worked with stakeholders and disability organisations to cascade information about access to work and to ensure disabled people's views are captured. This partnership working led to the introduction of a new flexible offer in 2020, including enabling disabled people to work flexibly from more than one location, a package of home working support which can be blended with workplace support, mental health well-being support for people returning to work, travel to work support for those who may no longer be able to safely travel by public transport due to the nature of their disability. Building on this co-production, we are working with stakeholders to see what more access to work can do to support disabled people who have the most significant barriers to employment. Building on the learning from our work with supported businesses and using their experience of supporting disabled employees, we're keen to go further and gain insight into how access to work could be used to open up employment opportunities for disabled people who require extensive adjustments to work. DWP will test whether providing additional support for employers who are willing to do more and flex job roles for those who need more than standard access to work can open up job opportunities for disabled people. DWP will run a proof of concept to gain insight into the difference this approach can make. Encouraging employers. A supportive employer can make a huge difference to disabled people. Approximately 55% of disabled people are of working age. Roy told us, I had no idea I was on the autistic spectrum until I watched a documentary on Channel 4 called Are You Autistic? What I saw really rang true with my experiences of life. This started me on the journey to being diagnosed. I was then able to sit down with a manager at Sainsbury's, which gave me a chance to reflect on my challenges at work and also look at ways of making my job easier. I wear ear defenders to cut out the noise on the shop floor to avoid too much sensory overload. I can also leave the shop floor for 10 minutes or so if it gets too much. It's also about getting clear and specific instructions from people to do my job. We want more employers to make the most of the talents disabled people can bring to the workplace. Reviewing Disability Confident The Disability Confident Scheme supports employers to make the most of the talents disabled people can bring. It gives employers the knowledge, skills and confidence they need to attract, recruit, retain and progress disabled people in the workplace. Over 20,000 employers have actively engaged with the Disability Confidence Scheme, covering over 11 million employees. We remain committed to an initial entry level one, which encourages employers of all sizes to begin the Disability Confident journey. However, we would like more employers to progress through the scheme and raise their ambition at levels two and three. DWP will work with the Disability Confident Professional Advisors Group, PAG, and the Business Leaders Group this year to review and strengthen Levels 2 and 3 of the scheme to support employers to increase disabled people's employment opportunities. The review will consider the content of Levels 2 and 3 to ensure it remains up to date, credible and sufficiently challenging. It will also explore further ways of encouraging employers to progress through the scheme effectively.
The Disability Confidence Scheme requires employees to commit to offering an interview to disabled people that meets the minimum criteria for the job, as specified by the employer. As part of the review, we will consider how this aspect of the scheme is working out in practice. The scheme will be updated by the end of this year. Disseminating best practice to employers We are committed to ensuring that employers, especially small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, have the best possible information and advice to support disabled people in the workplace. Employers have told us in recent consultations about shortfalls in the current offer. They report that they sometimes find this fractured, difficult to navigate and hard to apply in practice. We're working to provide a more tailored offer for employers that helps employers to support employees in a range of workplace situations. The design process also involves disabled people and SMEs. In 2021, DWP will develop and test an improved information and advice offer for employers. Best practice will also be shared through Disability Confident. There is a significant amount of information for disability confident employers in the Disability Confident Employer Packs and on gov.uk. This content will also be reviewed and updated in 2021 to ensure that it meets the needs of employers. These efforts to join up information available to employers will be complemented by wider efforts to inform disabled people and employers about their employment rights. The Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, BEIS, working with the Advisory, Conciliation and Arbitration Service, ACAS, has developed a new online advice hub. From July 2021, its remit is to provide clear, accessible information and advice on employment rights for disabled people. The advice hub will be available to both disabled people and employers providing information and advice on disability discrimination in the workplace, flexible working, rights and obligations around reasonable adjustments, fairness in redundancy situations, occupational health and mental health conditions. The Hub will provide advice to disabled people in England, Scotland and Wales. In Northern Ireland, advice is available through the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland. Disability Workforce Reporting DWP worked with large employers and expert partners to develop a voluntary reporting framework to help organisations to record and voluntarily report information on disability, mental health and well-being in the workplace. It is aimed at employers with 250 or more employees, though also open to smaller employers who are keen to drive greater transparency in their organisation or industry. In November 2019, DWP introduced a requirement that new and renewing disability confident leaders, Level 3, would report against the framework. There is increasing interest in making disability reporting mandatory, particularly for large employers, while recognising the challenges facing businesses. To explore this further, we will seek the views of stakeholders and shape future policy depending on the outcome of that exercise. In 2021, Cabinet Office will consult on workforce reporting on disability for large employers, exploring voluntary and mandated workplace transparency, and publish a set of next steps. The consultation will consider how employers can better understand the profile of their workforce in terms of disability, using a standardised question when asking employees about their disability status, the type of information and data employers could collect and ways to do this in a standardised manner. What information may already be held and cost issues. Tools and guidance to help employers report in a consistent and effective way. Lessons learned from existing reporting frameworks. Ways to maximise take-up and employer engagement. What might be reported to the government and whether the government should publish it. Alongside the consultation, we will continue to raise awareness and encourage take-up of the voluntary reporting framework, including promoting the business benefits of reporting. DWP will promote the framework and benefits of reporting by using its social media channels, 
Job Centre Plus networks and disability confident employer networks and newsletters. Working with partners across government, such as with BEIS and HMRC, and with the private and voluntary sectors. Inviting supporters of the voluntary reporting framework to outline their approach and the benefits as they see it through case studies. In addition, we will highlight the business benefits of workforce reporting as part of wider discussions on developing inclusive workplace cultures to encourage a more open approach. Expanding Supported Employment Services DWP is committed to expanding successful Individual Placement and Support IPS, trials that use an evidence-based approach. IPS provides support to move people with health conditions into work quickly and support them to stay there. The DWP will also expand use of the Place, Train and Maintain Support Employment model in partnership with local authorities. DWP will fund a local supported employment trailblazer working with 20 local authorities expected to begin in autumn 2021. The Trailblazer will support approximately 1,200 people. At least two-thirds of participants will be people with a learning disability and autistic people who use local authority social services. People with learning disabilities face particular barriers to employment, with only 6% of people with learning disabilities currently in work. Strengthening rights for disabled people in the workplace. Flexible working can make all the difference for disabled people. Tom told us, I started my career at KPMG in 2014 as a financial modeler. 18 months later, I had a massive stroke and was left with no feeling on my left hand side, using a wheelchair. Work has been fantastic supporting me. My return to work was based from home originally and then I went back into the office part-time. I was working remotely before Covid but it has now given me the opportunity to do international work that I never would have been able to do before. I'm open and honest to the firm about my day-to-day -day experiences. I lead from the front to provide that voice and to support others to have confidence to open up about their experiences as well. Work has been one of the best rehabs. It has helped my self-esteem and improved my memory and concentration. We want to make it easier for disabled people to work flexibly, if they would like to do so. The experience of working from home during the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates the importance of choice. While fewer disabled people than non-disabled people stated finding working from home difficult, 11% for disabled and 21% for non-disabled Working from home is not suitable for everyone. Diane told us, My adapted office chair will take up half a living room or half a bedroom, and I already have the wheelchair in my bedroom, so it just doesn't work. BEIS is reviewing the statutory right to request flexible working. We are committed, subject to consultation, to make flexible working the default, unless employers have good reason not to. BEIS will launch a consultation by the end of 2021 on making flexible working the default in Great Britain, unless employers have good reason not to. Introducing unpaid carers leave. We know that many people caring informally for disabled people are balancing this with work commitments. Many employers are supportive. 54% of employed carers who responded to the UK Disability Survey agree or strongly agree their employer is supportive of their caring responsibilities, although only 26% agree or strongly agree that their promotion opportunities are the same as their colleagues. We are committed to introducing an entitlement to leave for unpaid carers of up to one week and have since completed a consultation. BEIS will set out next steps in progressing the government's commitment to introduce unpaid carers leave across Great Britain by the end of 2021. This new entitlement will help unpaid carers to balance their caring responsibilities with paid employment. Supporting disabled entrepreneurs. Starting and growing a business takes courage, commitment and a lot of hard work. 
The idea is perhaps the easy part. Creating a business plan, sorting out financing, marketing, building a team. The things to do list will be long. In return, entrepreneurs enjoy the satisfaction of making their own way with independence and flexibility. Disabled people share the same aspirations. We want to help more disabled people realise their potential through this route. BEIS will publish proposals by the end of 2021 to ensure that every disabled person who wants to start a business has the opportunity to do so. This work will cover issues including access to finance for disabled entrepreneurs, the availability of existing business support and an assessment of the additional challenges people with disabilities face when starting a business and include extensive engagement with disabled entrepreneurs and disability stakeholders. Supporting disabled civil servants to thrive at work. The civil service has made good progress as an inclusive employer, although challenges remain. 12.8% of civil servants in UK government departments identify as having a disability, compared with 7.6% a decade ago and 10% in 2018. Efforts to better support disabled civil servants have included increasing disabled representation on talent schemes and providing a bespoke development scheme for disabled employees, Disability Empowers Leadership Talent, Delta. We will continue to grow our multi-award winning work experience and development programmes and to encourage departments and the wider public sector to offer supported internships. Elements include the Autism Exchange Programme, which grew to over 90 placements by 2020, the Early Diversity Internships Programme, 15% of interns in 2020 were disabled, and the Summer Diversity Internships Programme, 28% of interns in 2020 were disabled. We're also excited to partner with Leonard Cheshire to offer disability internships in the civil service under its Change 100 scheme in 2021 and beyond. The Northern Ireland Civil Service, NICS, is also demonstrating its commitment to ensuring that disabled people are recruited, retained and progress. The NICS conducts targeted outreach in partnership with disability organisations to encourage and promote its career opportunities to disabled applicants. Additional initiatives include the Work Experience Scheme for People with Disabilities and the NICS People Strategy, which is focused on better supporting and enabling career progression for disabled civil servants. The Scottish Government published its Recruitment and Retention Plan for Disabled People in 2019. Senior Civil Service, SCS, recruitment diversity has improved significantly. Action includes sponsorship arrangements with all disabled SCS who have self-identified for talent purposes and a single point of contact for adjustments. 34% of attendees at the Future Leaders Diversity Conference 2020 identified as disabled. A new workplace adjustment service is being piloted, with full rollout due in October 2021. The Welsh Government's Workplace Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Strategy 2021-26 sets out its targets for 20% of the people it recruits to be disabled by 2026. It has a target to promote disabled people at a rate which exceeds their population share and has committed to embed the social model of disability. It is committed to remove methodological barriers in recruitment. Welsh Government is a disability confident leader and the first government department to sign up to Changing Faces Pledge to be Seen. Progression remains a challenge. While progress has been made with the proportion of disabled civil servants at senior civil service level, it remains 3% below what it is across the whole civil service. Jess told us, I've had mobility issues since birth, but always focused on what I can do rather than what I can't. I have done a wide variety of operational roles in our organisation, including a posting overseas in a hostile environment. I currently lead a large project team and am a trained coach. I've only felt disabled when people have made assumptions about my abilities. I hope to take on further leadership roles which promote the things that helped me perform at my best. 
an openness to consider alternative ways of doing things, and an emphasis on building teams which harness different skills and life experiences. We will go further to support disabled civil servants to thrive at work. All UK government departments will encourage and support workplace disability networks to talk about disability issues, change perceptions and encourage inclusive behaviour, achieve and maintain the highest level of disability confident accreditation alongside other major public bodies, ensure responsive and timely support to meet workplace adjustment needs. This will include training leaders and managers and ensuring clear and accessible guidance is in place by early 2022. Develop and embed flexible working so that it helps disabled people to thrive and progress in their careers, works for all civil servants and meets the needs of the civil service. By September 2021, the Ministry of Defence, MOD, will publish a plan to bring more disabled people into the civilian workforce to meet its target of 15.3% by 2030. Civilians are civil servants working alongside military personnel, both in the UK and overseas, on postings or operational deployments. More opportunities for disabled people to serve in defence and the security agencies. We want disabled people to have the opportunity to serve in the armed forces and the agencies as well as in the civil service. We welcome everyone with the skills and aptitude we are seeking. That extends to the intelligence community. All three security agencies, MI5, MI6 and GCHQ, will ensure that our workforce will be fully representative of wider society we serve by 2030. MI6 will strive to ensure that by 2025, 9% of the organisation is drawn from those identifying as disabled, both overall and at each grade. MOD will lead by example, creating more opportunities for disabled people to serve. As reservists, MOD will explore how to increase opportunities for disabled people to serve as part of the Armed Forces Reserves by the end of 2023 including promoting better use of disabled reservists for appropriate roles across the armed forces and guaranteeing interviews for disabled reservists who meet the minimum requirements when recruiting for those roles. Armed Forces By 2025, MOD will deliver the Armed Forces Recruitment Programme to recruit more diverse military personnel, including disabled people. We will experiment with the recruitment of more diverse military personnel into the new National Cyber Force, using it as a pathfinder for this increased inclusivity. The rest of part one of the strategy is explained in the next video.